वेलकम टू द फेस्टिवल ऑफ भारत आई एम योर होस्ट कमल माड़ी शेटी एंड योर टूर इन टू सीजन फोर ऑफ द फेस्टिवल ऑफ भारत We are a platform that believes in having open and frank conversations about Bharat. And today we are going to discuss some very important subjects about Bharat. And to do this, we have a very special guest with us, Rene Linji. Rene Linji is an activist, author, columnist, and founder of the Voice of India project. Rene Linji regularly speaks against the lies and propaganda about India uh, and Hindus in particular. In her book, India Strip. she has thoroughly investigated the mainstream media and its smear campaigns against india all of which which we are going to discuss today namaste rene ji and welcome to the festival of bharat now oh, pranam and namaste thank you so much for having me i'm very honored to be here thank you so much it's just a wonderful show very informative i've been watching it for years so thank you so much thank you so much rene ji and we are so delighted uh, to welcome you at the festival of bharat uh, rene ji before i uh, uh, you know begin i was just wanted to ask you uh, how have you been uh, during this time and you know if you could tell us uh, some of the uh, uh, latest act- activities that you are involved in currently oh okay you mean during the lockdown time yes. so a lot of inside the house so we're not in complete lockdown here in america we you know the restaurants are open but you know not on the full scale that it was before the uh covid-19 so i i just been doing a lot of writing and videos for my social media and just things like that in general and um actually i'm doing another book but um this one's more kind of on health and like frequencies and essential oils because i'm really big on health cuz i think that really connects us and when you're in really good health then everything else just seems to fall together it just like connects so that's what i basically have been doing during this lockdown time so and wait eagerly waiting to get back to india <laughs> that that's wonderful uh, rene ji uh, if i have been watching your youtube channel and i would uh, strongly recommend our viewers to also check it out um uh, rene ji you know you talked about visiting india and uh, i know that you the, the first time you visited india was in 2009 uh, and mm-hmm. you considered it uh, a very life changing experience uh, you know we would love to know about how dharma you know help change your outlook towards life could you share uh, and tell us about that okay so india and dharma has really transformed me to a better person it liberally it liberated me and um firstly just um to talk on india india as a world traveler i've been to so many countries and india now 23 times I've been to other countries one time but I've been to India 23 times and the people in India they're different they're kind they're hospitable I love when I first went to India and I love the namaste and the touching of my feet and just the people calling me bhan and dd so it's like you feel connected So me as a foreigner I didn't feel like a foreigner like I felt like family they they treated me like family and you know going to other countries they these the, it's so simple gestures but it's so powerful and you don't see that in other countries but you see that in India so um you never really got homesick I guess to say because you always felt that someone was there they invited you to lunch they invited you to dinner so and i think a lot of that stems from hinduism so i started learning about um hindu dharma and i found it so logical and practical and spiritual and just the um principles of ahimsa so um ahimsa sorry is um it's non-violence. So I love 
that main principle of Sanata Dharma is the nonviolence. And that really touched my heart and soul. It, it's such a beautiful principle. And just having um, like regards to all life and animals. So I end up becoming a vegetarian and this was a, probably about 2006, I believe. And that also transformed me too. There's, there was something so powerful, spiritual and magical about when, when I became a vegetarian, I can't really explain it. It just, you become so more conscious about the environment and even with animals, when I go say to the food store and I see the packaged meat, you know, I can't even look at it now. It's, it's really disgusting. So it, it was just everything about India, its people, um, Dharma, it just really transformed me into a better person. That's why I always say um, Hinduism is the only choice for humanity. It really is. A, a, it, it's an amazing journey that I have been through and the most life changing, the most life rewarding experience I've ever had. So I'm very, I'm grateful to India and its people and Sanata Dharma. Thank you so much, uh, Reneji. I think that was a very uh, beautiful journey that you've shared with us. Um, it is very, very inspiring to hear about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Reneji, you are a, a vocal uh, Hindu activist. Uh, you know, and I was wondering, do you uh, sometimes feel that uh, Hindus tend to uh, be very oblivious to certain facts about their history, uh, which uh, we tend to see in the ways, uh, you know, they, they tend to neglect their own values and uh, the beauty of their own culture? Do you think so? Um, well, what I notice with Hindus, um, mainly the youth, is um, they really don't share or feel proud of all the accomplishments or really feel proud of being a Hindu. And I see a lot of them today that they're copying the West and they think the West is best. Where me, I'm from the West, but I am copying Hindu Dharma. So, um, and a, a lot of, this is my personal opinion. I think a lot of it stems from the liberal education that they're getting in India because I, and I hear it from the youth when I talk to them is because they glorify the invaders. So how is one supposed to feel proud of India, Hindu Dharma, I guess to say, when these, the, the school syllabus is glorifying the evaders and, and the um, Indian heroes, you know, it's like suppressed. So, and ironically, the same thing is happening here in America with the, the universities here. It's very liberal and they, they like to suppress the truth a lot. And, you know, even in the universities here with the Hindus, there's a, a lot of um, fake stories that the professors are telling the students. So it's not just in India, it's here also in America uh, about how, you know, invaders get glor glorified. So it's really a sad situation and it's actually, it seems like it's getting worse in time. Absolutely, uh, Daisy. I think you've raised very uh, important um, uh, things that I think, which have to be addressed uh, in our society, uh, in India especially. Uh, it actually uh, yes. takes me to uh, my uh, other question I had, which is, you know, something that we've come across recently. So there was mm -hmm. this uh, ruling uh, in Alabama, in the US, uh, where the uh, which was on on yoga and also on namaste, and it caused uh -huh. uh, you know 
for some kind of backlash. Uh, can you uh, please explain the uh, ru this particular ruling and uh, what was the origin of this and uh, why has it, you know, received, uh, you know, criticism? Okay, so on that particular um, topic, um, Alabama had actually banned yoga for decades. So recently, um, the House of Representatives passed legislation to offer yoga as an elective. So it went in favor of 73 to 25 to allow yoga in the schools, but it's only restricted to stretching and poses only. Um, they said it's illegal if you say namaste, there's no chanting, there's no mantras, there's no mudras. So basically they're saying it's yoga, it's allowed, but you can't do meditation or, 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 or chanting. So basically it's just sitting there stretching. It's really not yoga because the problem is, and it stems from Christianity, is they think that Hinduism is demonic. They think that Hindus are demonic. It's extremely dangerous and it's extremely racist. Now, I also want to point out that not all states in um, America are that orthodox, say, some states in the southern part of America are orthodox where, say, California or New York, New Jersey might not be as orthodox as some states. So they are really, really orthodox. And, you know, finally, I don't know the exact legislator that decided to bring it up. He really wanted to have yoga, I guess, probably the whole entire format in the schools, but supposedly it's called, you know, it's not banned anymore, but how can you practice yoga? You, there, you, you still can't, you know, do all the functions of yoga and all, all the other things that come with yoga, like the chanting and, you know, the mantras. So it's, it's really sad that um, a lot of people have this perception about Hinduism and that it's demonic. And a lot of this stems from Christianity and the pastors where they're always preaching that, you know, you have to accept Jesus as your personal savior or you're going to burn in hell. So people listen to that and they believe that all other religions are demonic. It's only Jesus. And I just want to point this one Point of how dangerous it is in America, there's this one author, his name is Derek Prince. And I read this a, a long time ago, a couple decades ago. And he had said that Hindus are born demonic. Now he's, mind you, he's a very popular author. You know, he's wrote several books and he sells books. And most people know him, I guess, in the Christian world, I guess to say. So that statement, when I read that statement, this is like maybe 15, 20 years ago, I thought to myself, and this is even before I went to India and all this, maybe about 20 years ago. And I said, oh my God, that's such a horrible statement. And when I look back today at that statement, I'm like, Hindus are the nicest people in the world. They are the kindest people in the world. They have the best hospitality in the world to make this statement that saying Hindus are born demonic. See, this is very dangerous. And this is what's causing the Hindu phobic people to, you know, say that. And in this situation with Alabama, that Hindus are, I mean, I'm sorry, that yoga is demonic. So it's very, very scary. And unfortunately, this is the reality. I believe it's getting better, but you still have a, still a lot of orthodox states that are still on this, you know, trend 
of, you know, Hindu phobia. So hopefully it will get better in time. Absolutely. Uh, uh, you raised some very important uh, points. And, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you if the general attitude towards Hindus, uh, even on university campuses that we are seeing these days, uh, do you think that also, you know, is um, a, a consequence of, you know, this kind of a, a kind of a colonial, uh, a, a kind of a racist sort of a mindset and, and all of those mis, uh, misunderstandings and misperceptions that you uh, described, uh, do you think that uh, the attitude towards Hindus uh, also is a consequence of that? Oh, okay. So, oh, from the universities. Yes. Yeah, actually, um, it's really big. The universities around in America. I mean, we all know Audrey Trusky. I think I pronounced her last name correct. So she really has a big propaganda against Hindus. And um, I actually went to Rutgers University for a Citizenship Amendment Act protest. And um, she was there with her group and their signs chant in. And um, they really didn't seem why, why they didn't know they were there. They just kept chanting Azadi, Azadi. But it appeared that her students really didn't know why they were there. It's kind of like she told them to go there, take the signs and just start chanting Azadi, Azadi. So, um, in the interim, all this, me and an Indian lady, we actually walked up to her and we said, we want to talk to you after, you know, the protest. So um, she had said yes, but then the group ended up getting, um, you know, people were going here and people were going here and our group was going somewhere else. So we never physically had a chance to talk to her, but um, we were very kind you know, we weren't screaming at her or, you know, getting, I don't want to say violence, too harsh of a word, but, you know, very calm. Because when you confront people like that, you have to be very professional. You have to be meek and mild. Because as soon as you start being aggressive, that's the word I want to use. As soon as you start being aggressive and say cussing and you're not acting professional, People have cameras, they have videos. So, and they'll say, oh, I told you these Hindus are crazy. I told you these Hindus are crazy. So it's always good that, you know, to, to mind yourself and be professional when you're faced with people like that, because the problem is it's bad enough that they're already making lies about Hindus. I mean, all the talks at the universities now it's Hindus, RSS, Modi, they're racist, they're fascist. So that's their rhetoric that they're putting out there. And the Indian students that are coming from India to these universities are being brainwashed under people like Audrey and they actually believe her so, and believe me, it's not just happening in, in Rutgers, it's, it's happening in all these universities a, across America where, you know, they want to portray the image that Hindus are fascist, racist, starting riots. So it's really dangerous. Uh, very, very true, uh, Renaji. Um, you know, it, uh, I want to actually ask you about your book um, in, in your book, The in, uh, India Strip, uh, you have uh, very uh, meticulously uh, shown the side of India, uh, which is deliberately hidden, uh, you know, by several vested interests. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yet you've also spoken about how uh, Hindus also don't sometimes recognize about how, uh, you know, some of these voices uh, of, of India about India and dharma that we need. Uh, so uh, do you think Hindus need to, uh, you know, regroup in a sense uh, and, and be more serious about these issues, uh, the, especially the, some of the contemporary issues? 
uh, and in that sense uh, do you, do you uh, see them uh, you know learning from uh, some of the other uh, uh, players in the uh, in, in in the world mm -hmm. yeah so that's a really great question because that's one of the questions that really um, aggravates me is I see a lot of Hindus, they're very quiet, you know, they might feel um, passionate about a topic, but they don't do anything about it. That's why in my books, on my videos, my tweets, I always get out there that you, ha you have to do something. You can't be silent spectators. Nothing gets done by being silent spectators. And I, I even see them emailing me, um, commenting me on my website, they fill out the form. And they always say to me, oh, you're so brave, you're so brave. But I'm saying, no, you need to be brave. You need to get out there and you need to be vocal because it's really starting to take a snowball effect, it seems. So we all need to come together and be a part of this. And I always tell them that, um, you know, you see what the celebrities in Bollywood are doing, how if an issue comes up with a Hindu, they're silent, okay? So why are you supporting them? Boycott Bollywood. Don't go to their movies. They're not supporting you. So why would you give them one cent of your rupee when you see what they're doing against the Hindus and their propaganda? I said, even the media channels don't support these people because they always try, they have this rhetoric against the Hindus. And they always make it look like Hindus are the troublemakers. Hindus are starting riots. So, you know, th this, is, this is really getting out of hand and nothing gets done if we're all quiet. So I've become more like a motivational, inspirational speaker because I, I, I like that too, because I feel like I have to motivate and inspire, especially the youth, you know, don't worry about what people think about you. Who cares if you have this passion for Hindus and, you know, you want to get out protests, write an article, write a book, do something. Who cares what your peers think? And I think the liberal Hindus or, again, the liberal education is really causing this problem with the youth to feel ashamed of themselves especially when they're glorifying invaders, like I said. So that's why, uh, that's one of my main jobs I love to do is motivate. And I do get a lot of um, emails and comments that said, oh, you made me more patriotic. So that is really good news that, you know, it's working. So if I have to be a cheerleader on the sidelines, you know, cheer them on, then, you know, that's another hat that I'll wear because I know it works, that they see a foreigner in America, you know, is rooting for India, rooting for Hindus, you know, trying to get the truth out about what really is the truth about India, what really is the truth about the Hindus. So if I can do it, you can do it in India, something you can do something. There's something that somebody can do, but we really, now is the time where we really all need to come together and we really all need to be united. Now is the time because the media has gotten worse. Big tech has gotten worse. And believe me, they're not for us. They're really not for us. It's, they're against us. So it makes it harder. And you have to be very... Um, you know, mindful of even how you write on Facebook and Twitter now, you know, and, and YouTube, the videos, what you say, because it's, it's, it's sad, but it is the truth because of this rhetoric, you know, we really have to be mindful of how we present ourselves so we can get more people out there to really know the truth about India 
and, and Hindus that India is a wonderful country and Hindus are very peaceful, loving, hospitable, hospitable community. So I, 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 I love being a cheerleader for India. I can easily can wear that hat too. <laughs> uh, thank you Arani, for sharing all of that. I think uh, your, uh, your words of advice uh, are all very relevant in the kind of world we live in and the kind of uh, challenges we face. Uh, in especially uh, when it comes to mm -hmm. the contemporary issues, um, Reniji, you have uh, you know I want to uh, you know ask you about uh, uh, there, there's one one event in in India's past in uh, you know that you have uh, vociferously spoken about, and that is uh, you know and and something that Hindus themselves are not aware of, uh, and uh, that is in 1966 when uh, you know at the then Congress government shot down. Uh, more than uh, you know, thousands of, of, of sadhus who were protesting against the practice of cow slaughter. Uh, now, and there are several other such incidents and events as well in the past and even in the present. Uh, so, uh, do you think it's because of some kind of uh, shortcomings on our part that we are not aware about these things, or, or do you also think that you know the the political and the the, the the elite establishment uh, that has ruled India for so long, for many decades, um, also played a role in suppressing a lot of this information from coming out and becoming public uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I can say for sure that Nehru is one of the big culprits of what has been happening in India because he said that he wanted to make India a secular country and he, he wanted the Hinduism taken out of the syllabus. So he had, he had such hatred for Hindus. Obviously, he really did. He was never there for the Hindus. So this all started, I believe, from Nehru and then here we go again with the education system in India. You know, it's very liberal. You know, the, the invaders, they're talked about hundreds and hundreds of times, but not one time, you know, Ram or Gita. So again, the truth is being suppressed in the Indian, you know, school system. So that needs to be changed. And I feel like the only person that could really make a difference and has really actually done that so far is Narendra Modi J. I mean, he has done incredible work since he has become the prime minister. And he's also one of the prime ministers that actually looks out for Hindus because the past um, prime ministers they seem like they put Hindus on the back burners, like Nehru, Indira Gandhi, like how you met, mentioned about um, the 1966 incident with the 5,000 sadhus um, that were brutally murdered because they wanted the, um, an anti-slaughter um, bill against cow slaughtering and um, Indira Gandhi would not, um, she said she would not cow down to save cows basically is what she said, some quote like that. So in the interim, she ordered um, the Delhi police, you know, they did this masquerade and in the end they're saying approximately 5,000 or so um, Sadhu's Hindu devotees were slaughtered. I mean, they shot them with, with spray guns, tear gas. And then in the middle of the night, when everybody's sleeping, they just stockpiled the dead bodies in trucks. They didn't even know if they were dead or alive. They just stockpiled them in trucks, drove them away and cremated them. See, this, this is what she did and still, um, you know, they had said, the Congress government said that they would put the anti-slaughter bill in the next parliament session, which they lied 
and it never happened. So, you know, it, it's her, it's Nehru, like all these, all, all these incidents and situations that has happened in India for decades under prime ministers like them, it's always Hindus are last. Hindus are on the back burner. So I feel like Narendra Modi is the best thing that really happened to India and Hindus because Hindus really only want equal rights. They really don't get equal rights and all of this is leading up. But thank God with Ram Mandir, um, Mandir the Citizenship Amendment Act, all these wonderful things that Narendra Modi ji is doing for India. He's finally looking out for Hindus. He finally trying to make you know, it, more um, equality. So I, I think it's great that India has such a wonderful prime minister. I mean, Modi ji is just fabulous. He works so hard and he has done so much for India. It's just unbelievable. I am his biggest fan. I wrote a book about him because I, I just, I, I, I see him, how great he really is. And, you know, things don't happen overnight. He is undoing decades, decades of damage that Nehru had started first and then the other ones in the Gandhi and all these other ones that put Hindus on the back burner. So he's getting there. He's done a lot of work. And like I said, things don't happen overnight. He's slowly undoing the damage that these past prime ministers ha has done damage to the Hindus. And I believe which started all this Hindu phobia. Absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, you spoke about Prime Minister Modi ji and, uh, and I want to ask you a little more about that. Uh, in your latest uh, book, Narendra Modi, uh, Mission Impossible, the uh, new 21st century Iron Man. Uh, you have written a comprehensive account about the Prime Minister's life uh, from very humble beginnings to being uh, one of the most uh, powerful leaders uh, in the 21st century. Uh, do you feel uh, he is uh, as popular and enigmatic uh, to the world outside India as well, uh, the way he is in Bharat? Uh, and then why do you think that is uh, so? Yeah, I do. Initially, I felt like it wasn't, but as time has gone by, like I feel like the world really globally accepts Modi. I think that they see his accomplishments that he's still in and all his achievements. I mean, he is really, he is not a coward. I love him. He knocks down doors. He is not afraid of anybody. You know, if he has something in his mindset that is great, he just goes out and tackle it. And I think people see the greatness of him. He really is a great leader and he does care about everybody. He really is remarkable. And just when, even me, when I, I said, oh, I want to write my second book about Narendra Modi ji, I said, because I see all these wonderful things that he's doing. So upon my research, I was like, wow, he really is genuine. He really is a spiritual person. He, he really is amazing. And now with the um, coronavirus, I mean, now he's, he really even catapulted to the next level because he's really done a brilliant job in handling the coronavirus, especially when you consider that India is about almost 1.4 billion people and he's handling it one of the best out of all the country. So people now even more has, you know, more respect for Narendra Modi J for handling the coronavirus. And it's just, he has done an absolute amazing job. But on the other end of the scope, you know, you have other people like news media channels, you know, all the universities that have the rhetoric that because he's a nationalist, right winger, if you want to say that, you know, so they label him as a racist and a fascist. So then you have, you know, 
that sector of people, you know, obviously, you know, that has their opinions. But I think overall, people really do see through the lies and the rhetorics and they really do see, wow, he's, India really has came a long way since he first took office in 2014. He really has. He's just done an amazing job from cleaning up India and the streets and telling people use waste baskets, throw your garbage in there. And another thing, um, the toilets, I mean, that is a great, especially for women, we really appreciate that. So the toilet program, and in my book also, I mentioned um, all his schemes and programs, hundreds that he's done for people of all communities, all levels. So a lot of people in India, because I, I see on social media, they don't like Modi, he's racist, oh, he, he's fascist, you know, he's RSS, you know, Hindu Tav. But read my book, it'll blow your mind, okay? He has done hundreds of programs, schemes. He helps everybody, big, small, no matter what religion you are. He's done work, help for the Muslim community, the Christian community. He really is there for everybody. He really is. And another reason why I wrote the book, because I'm just reading these horrible things. I'm like, no, that's not true. That's not true. So I did the research and it's not true. You know, he's amazing. All the, all, all the work he's doing for everybody, everybody equally, he's doing it. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, for uh, you know, laying that out and sharing uh, those insights with us, uh, Beninji. Uh, you know, before uh, I, I conclude the conversation, I also wanted to ask you uh, what your uh, plans are going forward uh, in terms of your seva for dharma. Uh, where uh, you know uh, can we find your books and uh, your? If you could tell us also about your YouTube channel, uh, what to look out for uh, in in the coming days and months. Mm hmm. OK, well, one of my biggest goals was I need to get back to India. It's been so long. So, yeah, but other than that, um, I just I just really been focusing on I, I like doing videos um, when a real major issue comes out in India. So I, I like doing um, videos. I have my YouTube channel, Renee Lynn Voice for India. That's where I start posting my um, videos against politicians or Bollywood. So I'm busy doing that. And on Twitter and Facebook, I'm also on um, Twitter and Facebook, Renee Lynn Voice for India. So I share my thoughts of, you know, things that are going on with India and Hindus and things like that. And also, um, if anybody's interested in um, purchasing um, India Strip, which is about the mainstream international media debunking it, all their lies about India and Hindus. And my um, Narendra Modi G book, it's on my website at www.voiceforindia.com. It's available all in the world. And in India, you can actually get the paperback. So right now I'm in the process of writing another book, but I'll still be vocal and activist, I'll still be the cheerleader that cheers on India and the Hindus, you know, to get out there and, you know, don't be silent spectators, get your voice heard, don't be silent because we all need to come together because it just seems like it's taken a snowball effect and we all need to do something. If we all do something, and we're all together in a community, a tight knit family community, then the more our voices can get out there and the more our voices can get heard. So people can know the truth. And it really does work because in my first book, India Stripped, I talk about the mainstream media. It's, there, there's so much corruption in the mainstream media and people actually they believe it. They believe fake news. 
So I did a lot of research on that and statistics comparing India to the rest of the world. And it will blow your mind. It's really shocking that Delhi is actually safer than New York City. Okay, but people, they, they listen to the news and other people without seeing for themselves. So they believe it and like, oh, I'm not going to get to India. So I've had foreigners buy my book and write me saying, thank you. I'm going to India. And they actually read some real news from my book. And now, you know, they're saying, I want to go to India. I, I believe it. So the media are, they are not our friends. The media today is extremely dangerous. And there's six major American news media channel, and they control 90% of everything we see and hear. And a lot of that is George Soros. And most people know who George Soros is, the American billionaire. He pays these media channels to say what he wants them to say. And he just recently said that he is going to pump out $1 billion to fight against nationalism. Okay, he has a fight against Narendra Modi J. Okay, and that's why he's pumping out $1 billion to fight against nationalism. This is his plan and this is what he wants to do. And he basically pays all these channels, you know, to make up all these lies about Hindus. All right. That's his rhetoric. And even when um, and he's done it with Trump, too. And one election, he pumped out twenty seven million dollars to try to get Bush defeated in the election in 2004. And he's done it in this last election with Trump and Biden. So he has the money and that's what George Soros does. And when Trump went to India for a namaste, Trump, all them riots that took that that went all over the place, that was funded by George Soros. This is what he does. And then he says it's nationalism, it's Hindus. Hindus are starting these problems. Hindus are troublemakers. Then he goes to the news media, say, pays them. So that's why people have this false narrative that Hindus are troublemakers because people like George Soros starts the riots, then says, oh, the Hindus are troublemakers. They started all, all, all these riots, they're troublemakers. But we know that's not the truth. It's all propaganda. And he has this Open Society Foundation, which he started in 1984. And under Open Society Foundation is a bunch of other, you know, sub foundations, I guess to say, under Open Society. And all these foundations are all working together to fight against nationalism, to fight against people like Trump to fight against people like Modi, to put this rhetoric out there that Hindus are dangerous. So that's why I keep getting out there and I keep fighting and getting vocal with my fellow Hindus, brothers and sisters in India. Look at this. I mean, we're really in a big fight. We really are in a big fight because when you have, um, these media channels that are funded by propagandists like George Soros, okay? And then they write articles that India is dangerous. India is the rape capital of the world. Hindus are violent. Hindus are troublemakers. Now they own most of these media channels and George Soros is funding them. And this is powerful, yes, but we have our own people and the truth always prevails. That's why I always say, and I always tell my Hindu brothers and sisters, come on, you got to get out there and we all got to do something together. Don't think that, oh, I'm a nobody. I can't do nothing. Don't think like that. That's not the truth at all. You can write an article, a book, do a video, get it all out there. That's what you can do. And if we all do that, then we can have a snowball effect over top of it and people can see 
the truth. And it does work. I've done it in my book. It does work. I've done it in videos. But the problem is people need to get some courage up. That's the problem with a lot. They need to get active. Instead of watching Bollywood movies, oh, look at this Bollywood song, you know? But then they go on Twitter and Facebook. Oh, I'm so mad. This Hindu girl was raped and the media lied. They won't talk about it. Well, you're watching Bollywood movies and you're sharing them. Look at this. But then you say something like that and you don't do nothing. That's why it's so critical. It's so critical that we do something. Everybody do something so we can have a snowball effect against this Hindu phobia that seems to be snowballing. So that is my main message that I have to all my Hindu and Hindu brothers and sisters that we must work on that and we must get stronger and we must get more united. It has been uh, extremely inspiring and uh, very insightful uh, and your call to action I am sure uh, will inspire uh, many more Hindus uh, to speak out and uh, you know uh, make sure that truth prevails. Uh, and we hope uh, that your voice grows stronger and continues to inspire uh, millions of people uh, in Bharat and all across the world, so that we can all live in a world where dharma uh, is established and and we live in a world that is a far better place uh, than we live in right now. Uh, thank you so much, Energy, for joining us today and sharing all of that with us. Uh, we're very grateful uh, to uh, have you with us. Uh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank and, you. Uh, to our viewers, uh, I would like to request you, uh, please continue supporting us uh, and do subscribe to uh, both our channels, the Festival of Bharat and Chitty Media. Uh, we will be back with another uh, such insightful and inspiring conversation. Uh, until then, take care and namaste. Namaste. We hope you enjoyed this Chitti Media content. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanavad, Namaskar. <laughs>